No commercial. <laughs> and cannabis hour. Uh, it- Welcome to the Benzinga Cannabis Hour. There are more people who are in favor of legalization. I saw the benefits of it for myself. have to ask was there pot pasta in that cannabis cookbook oh, it was gorgeous there was pot pasta they were we were talking about cannabis pasta that opened my eyes to the cannabis industry is this new industry where now billions of dollars are being made we're here to bring cannabis into culture What up, everybody? Javier, what up? what's up, man? All good. All good in the hood. How are you doing? Oh, you're one of those people that says all good to what's up. You know <laughs> what? Quick quick story. I went into, uh, I think it was uh, Starbucks the other day, and uh, mm-hmm. the dude said, enjoy. I, I go, you too. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just going to go. That. Like, yeah. <laughs> It was one of those moments that you can't come back from. You just got to walk out the door. Like, I lost. I lost that moment. It's okay. I mean, was it a good tip at least? Maybe maybe you left a very good tip and we're like, hey, here, enjoy. You know, you know let's, I, let's I always leave good tips. I worked for years as a server and a, a manager at restaurants. It, that is the devil's work. Let me tell you right now. You need the devil's lettuce for that work. It's interesting you bring that up, by the way, because yesterday I was watching this um, report about um, restaurants in the U.S. struggling to find workers now. And one of the main uh, forces behind this that they say, you know, is driving a lack of interest in in the um, hospitality industry are cannabis shops. A lot of chefs and restaurateurs and cocktail how are they um, gathering that data, though? Like, are they going to these people and saying, hey, where would you have worked if you had not worked at Cresco Labs? Well, I would have I mean, been a waiter. No, it's just like all, all the people that had to be laid off during the pandemic from the hospitality industry, many of them found jobs in the cannabis industry. Right? I, I love that. But Don't get me wrong. They're preparing formulations yeah. or whatever. So now these restaurants now suddenly need like another chef or, you know, a sous chef. Right, or other cooks and they're like okay there's no one willing to work you know in the industry for lower wages and terrible hours if you can go work in in, in pot like they you know, you know pot. this isn't exactly what she does but in about 10 minutes i think it'd be cool to get susan's insights on that topic oh, uh yeah. you know i feel like she'd probably have some cool kind of maybe data points or insights uh, it's not what she does, albeit, but I don't know. I'd love her thoughts there. But anyway, Javier, it's been like a week and a half since we've done a show, man. I've missed it. We had an awesome conference last week. If you guys didn't get a chance to check that out, we went through like 20 uh, cannabis and psychedelics companies uh, from MindMed and uh, Neon great. Mind and uh, Midasin and uh, Numinous, tons of cool psychedelic stocks, and then Tilt Holdings and um, – I'm sorry, I'm, I'm CBD of Denver, a marijuana company of America. Jesus came back and spoke to us. It was an awesome day. Uh, two I days. You something. If you, and I'm going to put you, you know, on this spot for a second. If you had to pick one thing that you learned from the conference last week, from the Benzinga mm. small cap conference. You know what? I, I, <laughs> I, I learned that, you, you know, there are, mm, how do I say this without giving a recommendation? Um, all right, recommendation not up here. I definitely invested some money last week. <laughs> um, oh, you know, yeah. so maybe it wasn't the point for me to invest my money, but I did. What you buy? Um, okay, what you buy? I bought a bunch of mind med. Um, you know, so I, that was really my main purchase from that day. Two days of content. I did buy in to like. Uh, some companies that are kind of on the outskirts uh, of industries that I think could succeed. Like uh, there was like solar integrated roofing, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, there was uh, Virios Therapeutics, V-I-R-I, I thought was pretty cool. They have a former Pfizer exec leading that team. Um, gosh, man, I, I mean, 
that I, honestly, I learned about different companies. And that was that's the point of our conference, though. You do get education. You do get panels on certain topics, like, for instance, why psychedelics are. Uh, you should invest in the medical, uh, the medical, I guess, phenomenon behind it. Um, but you also get deep dives into these companies operationally, growth wise. Um, and, and that to me is the benefit of it. I mean, um, fans know us very well. We're all about being actionable, right? Yeah. If, if you're, you know, reading a Benzinga article, attending a Benzinga conference, and you're leaving wondering, okay, so how do I play this in the stock market? We failed you. So like, you let us know. <laughs> that's Mario, true. That, that's a very true statement. But we, we had a ton of content come out, ton of presentations, several panels in Fireside, Solar Up. He's one of my favorites. He's in the chat during all these conferences, asking questions. Uh, you're a champ, man. Shout out to you. Uh, and I think Cybin is awesome. Cybin, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, that's the one with 10 current patents that are under mm -hmm. uh, uh, under review, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah. He posted a very nice video um, highlighting some of Cybin's recent milestones this week. Benzinga.com slash cannabis or Benzinga.com slash topic slash psychedelics, and you'll find the article on Cybin. Yeah, yeah, and I think that went into MSN, so you guys did a killer job on the content side. And yep. Chad, that was SIRC. And, and talking uh, about company. the Benzinga news, you know, I, I don't know if, you know, our, our viewers know this, but, you know, Benzinga has, you know, represented the cannabis industry in many, many, many different circumstances. You know, we, we've judged uh, the South by Southwest pitch contest. You know, yesterday we, we or today we spoke at the Prohibition Partners live event. So, you know, mm -hmm. hundreds of events that we've been at. Today, we uh, were welcomed into the Rolling Stone Culture Council. So that's live already. I love that you say we. I, I want to make it very clear. Javier is a very important part of Benzinga's team, but a lot of this is his. But it's we. Yeah. yeah, it's we. I mean, this is, you know, what we do. I'm, I'm there representing Benzinga. It's not just, just me who's there. So. Uh, true. I mean, we're here representing Benzinga. Uh, it's what we do. Um, I will say red light, solar up red light, I think, they're going to be an easy value play. I don't think to me, I, I don't see as much long-term value as like a mind med right, um, right. right now. Yeah, I mean, companies shift, they change, they buy people. What are you going to do? Like, I, this is just what I have right now. But, I like it. I'm not sure how big the adult use. That's my, that's exactly my hesitation right. is I don't like, see them I, entering a market like the U S in yeah, I mean, a you, long you time. Truffles only so many times in your life, and they retail for like twenty bucks, right? If you go to Amsterdam, like the most expensive dose you can take is like twenty euros, right? Yeah, and you can do that like two, three, five times, right? It's not like you're going to be tripping all day. I, I don't know, but at the same time, you know, Bruce Linton is involved. There's always, you know, that's always a kind of assurance. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, he's involved in like thirty thousand companies, though. Um, so God love him. The dude works his butt off. Yeah. What's that shade? <laughs> it wasn't shade. Like, I mean, the dude has success. He's just having success in a lot of places. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, you can't deny that he's in a bunch of companies right now. Um, you know what my favorite one is though? Oscar yeah. capital. Keep an eye on Oscar capital. They're a, a fund in Europe and who they decide to put their capital into to me is going to be super interesting. And Bruce Linton is a part of that team as well. Oh, there you go. That's that's why. So talking about Bruce Linton. So Bruce Linton was uh, one of the founders of Canopy Growth, uh, CEO for many years, for those who are not aware. Tweed. Canopy Growth, NYSC, CGC, named today, you know, Martha Stewart, as its official strategic advisor. What does it mean? It means that Martha Stewart will be providing the company with dedicated counsel on product innovation and format development, strategic partnerships. So basically what she's been doing so far, developing her own lines, but just working more closely with management. Well, hopefully we can get her at our event soon. Canopy's at all of our events for cannabis. Maybe we can get Martha up there to talk about, you know, how she's diving in a little further. You know, I do want to take that shift though. Let's take like four to five minutes here before we get Susan on uh, to run through some news. I want to pose a few questions to our audience uh, and I'll pose these between guests as well. Um, you know, I'm curious, are you all focused on all cannabis stocks, just interested in general education here, uh, or do you focus on rec, 
um, medicinal and or biotech stocks in particular in the cannabis industry. So posing that question to you all, are there particular sectors in the cannabis space you, you focus on and that you follow? Uh, or are you just here for general stock information on the cannabis space? Uh, so that's one of my questions. And two, uh, are you strengthening your positions right now in, in, in the dip? Mm -hmm. Are you looking at a Kerna or Village Farms or um, a Tilray uh, or some of these ETFs, you know, that or, have been down? Or are you buying the crypto dip instead? And yeah, or, or are you not buying right now? Right, yeah, yeah I, so those two questions, I'm super interested on our audience's take there. Uh, shoot me a Twitter, shoot me a Twitter, uh, a Twitter, shoot me, <laughs> I'm like, I can't believe I just said that. Shoot like me a, a tweet. <laughs> that's, that's that stuff. <laughs> oh my God. Wow. That was bad. Um, so those are my two questions, uh, I, but we can pose those again between. Uh, feel free to drop your answers in anytime. I'll try and check them and maybe at the end or next show, uh, you know, we'll address some of those, but I'm super interested in those. Aaron, thank you for putting those up there. Um, hey, I want to call out a pretty strong number that I think has gone underspoken and that's driven by STEM. STMH yep. is the ticker. Uh, STEM Holdings is what they were, but still have the STMH ticker. Revenue numbers, if you just look at the, what they made, it's not impressive. But looking at what they made, I mean, in comparison to other cannabis companies, looking at what they made Q1 2021 over Q1 2020, I think is really impressive. Um, it could be their acquisition of driven deliveries um, with, you know, adding more aspects of, of revenue. Um, but I think this stock is a little bit undervalued right now. Do you have any? Uh, this is the wrong one, by the way. SCMH. That's what we're looking at. Yep. Here we go. That's the one. Yeah, perfect. All right. So, Javier, do you have any thoughts there? I really like their model. Um, we've had their CEO in the past. I think his experience is, is incredible. Um, he, he was one of the responsibles, uh, you know, of the creation of the underlying technology for, um, what is it? The, the one that's delivery. Oh my God. Grubhub. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I live abroad. I don't yeah. use, um, for Grubhub and, and like he's made a lifelong bed in home deliveries and that's what they're doing now, right? They have production and they have retail and they don't only deliver their own brands, but they sell other brands. So, you know, they, they do the whole, you know, seat to doorstep or, or something similar that they call it. I like the model. Uh, as you say, the valuation looks pretty interesting. Again, this is not a recommendation. And nope. pretty good earnings. Uh, of course, it's easy. Like a lot of companies um, have been recently reporting record, record revenues. But this is like it's just a, a nascent industry. Like quarter yeah. after quarter after quarter, we hear like, hey, record revenue, record revenue. It's like, yeah, I mean, you did better than last quarter. Yeah, like, but what you hear is like 100%. Um, and I, maybe that is because the revenues are so high. The, the actual number, the dollar number that they're bringing in is so high. They're not going to quadruple it or, or times it by five. Um, but, but I think STEM's percentage change is, is, is notable. That's just my thought there. Um, we do have a question from Chad in the chat. Is Akerna a decent company and why? Yes. Yes, they are a very decent company, in my opinion. Again, no recommendations here. Um, Akerna is the leading seed to sale software company, uh, helping operators, really growers, uh, with compliance and tracking. Um, and they, they were the first cannabis spec, I believe. If I'm not mistaken there, Javier, correct me if I'm wrong. I think, I mean, what probably, I mean, it was a merger acquisition. I think it was not a SPAC. I'm not sure. Maybe it was, was. A, yeah, or I don't know. Yeah. I think it was a SPAC. Um, I just didn't know if they were the first was or not. It? could be yeah, wrong. Um, but Acquisition Corp. So they merged, they did a reverse merger with MTEC Acquisition Corp, becoming mm -hmm. the first woman-led cannabis company to trade on the NASDAQ. Uh, and as I've said many times before, one of the things that I feel most uh, bullish about other than their international footprint is the fact that this is a, a, a piece of technology or technology company that can go beyond cannabis to many other highly regulated and generally regulated. I thought I read that it was a SPAC, but I'm getting I'm getting double attacked here. So maybe I was wrong. Um, I'll, I'll happily be wrong there, y'all. Um, 
anyway, I do think Akerna is a solid company. I think as the space goes, Akerna goes, uh, obviously. So I think, you know, this is one that the value play there is um, probably a little bit longer than, uh, you know, a lot of active day traders or retail investors, but I think this is a solid play. Anyway, Javier, we have run out of time for news uh, in our first segment here. That's okay. We have a couple awesome guests. Our first one is Susan Emile from THC Regs. After yes. that, uh, we do have a cool, I think, discussion uh, around blockchain and cannabis with Brian Cox, the CEO of Surge Pays. Uh, so I'm super excited to have both of them on. Shall we get started? Please, let's, let's do, it. do it. Susan, what's up? <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> I feel like, like I was just in a time machine back to my prior life watching you guys. So it was, it was actually quite fun. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, are we old? Are we old school? What's going on? Your prior life? No, in my prior life working with securities markets. It was just, you know, I love how you guys say we're not making a recommendation. Really? <laughs> yeah, definitely not. No, I mean, it's great. Yeah. Awesome. Welcome, so back Susan. back then, I actually... Oh, thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Back then. Oh, no, no. Back then. You're only 30 saying... years old. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, but back then, I think, you know, it was, you know, very much, you know, of a, a market structure play as well, like the cannabis space. And, you know, so I feel like it's just an extension of the financial services industry into the cannabis market, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the goal. Hopefully we have a lot of awesome investors that, that watch our news um, every, every two times a week. And we appreciate everybody here. Uh, Susan, you have been a friend of ours for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I would say since I've been at Benzinga, I've known THC regs and Susan and Josh. Um, so if you all have attended or watched any of our conferences before, you've probably seen uh, the THC crew, but just in case, Susan, can you give us a rundown uh, of what exactly you guys are up to in the space? Sure. Um, in fact, we we have a lot of information that your the people who are watching this show would really like. Um, we are we actually um, you know take and aggregate all the information across the the fragmented cannabis markets. So if you think about the securities markets, the securities markets there are a ton of different trading venues, which is very similar to the cannabis markets. The cannabis markets, if you think of each state, each state is is a separate market with its own rules of how the business is structured and how um, you can start a business and, and make money. And so what we do is we bring everything together um, and we we extract the data, we enrich the data, and then we we put it into you know a couple of our products. We have one product for the business, we have another product for uh, the, your compliance group. So you know it's an inner enterprise solution. Um, and, you know, for the business product, we really tell you where, when, and how you can actually start a cannabis business. And right now we're covering 5,000 cities. And, you know, a lot of uh, folks who actually are in the business or want to get into the cannabis business, you know, it's impossible for an individual to do this by themselves. And to date, a lot of people have been. I mean, we are, uh, you know, analyzing um, all of the cities within New Jersey, New York, Ohio, California, we identify, you know, those cities that currently permit every single license type, not just dispensaries, but license types across the, across the board. And we tell you, you know, when those cities are accepting applications, you know, what type of real estate you need to actually get an application approved, uh, where you, we actually have real estate tools that help you find real estate. Uh, so it's a soup to nuts from concept. And then once you start operating, we have an com enterprise compliance technology to help you uh, um, mitigate the risk and comply with the regulations. How difficult is it for your for companies to gather all of this information without a platform like yours? <laughs> I think people have been walking from city to city, and you know, I think that there have been a, a couple of ways that people have been doing it. Um, either through lawyers, they've been using real estate brokers, or really walking from city to city. Um, and so, <laughs> so what we're doing is is we're just you know. Um, you know, bringing that information to light um, and, you know, putting it into one platform. It's a dashboard view, very simple. Um, uh, Josh, our, our chief technology officer, is brilliant at creating very user-friendly displays that, you know, you don't have to have a PhD to operate. <laughs> so it's, it's actually 
actually a, a really great system. I love that. One quick follow before Javier jumps in. I know he's got tons. Um, I feel like last time I talked to you was 2000. Did you all bump up the data no. or am I making that up? Was it 5,000? 5,000 cities. Oh, oh, yeah. No, in the last three months, we went up to 5,000. Wow, you guys have made upgrades, Susan. And we are continuing to to grow. And so it's, it's you know, I mean, it's, I think we, we now realize that, you know, we really, everybody needs to get ahead of the emerging markets, right? And so to date, if you, if you don't get ahead of the emerging markets, it's very difficult. I mean, I remember in New Jersey in 2019 when people were actually trying to find real estate and nobody could find real estate. And it's crazy because we've analyzed all 590 cities in New Jersey. And, you know, probably I would say right now about 30% of those cities have opted in or, or opted out. And of that 30%, you know, there may be 20 where you can actually that has said, yes, you know, we'll permit businesses here. And so it's it's exceedingly competitive. And in states like New Jersey, where you have to have property and you have to have the city council say, yep, you know, you're going to get a business. You, we're, we're OK with you starting a business here. It's the only way that you can actually get a license. And so if you just look at the numbers of where things are heading, if you don't have a very quick response, in, meaning if you don't have an immediately click to get real estate, or if you don't have the lots of capital that you're going to need to hire that lawyer or that lobbyist or that real estate broker, then you're not going to get a license. That's interesting. Um, you were saying, you know, one of the things you do is analyze and help people decide where, when, and how to start a business, right? And I'm not <laughs> going to ask you to spill all the secret sauce, but what are you seeing in terms of where to start a business right now? Uh, which locations are more business friendly? Uh, which locations do you think are it's a great question. Offering the, the, the you know, largest growth potential for companies or the best mm -hmm. value for money? That is a great question. <laughs> and that's actually what, it, what our technology does. <laughs> so what we do is we try to make it really easy to, you know, on a jurisdiction by city by city basis to understand at the city level what the taxes are, what the fees are, you know, how rigorous the regulatory requirements are, um, you know, what the competitive landscape. And I think the really cool thing that we've done, and like I said at the beginning, we have, you know, tech tools and information that your watchers would really like, is that we've actually gone down to the license level so we have a national license database so if you're look if you're let's say you're interested in New Jersey or New York New York is going to be a fantastic market you can mm -hmm. you know pull up one of our real estate tools and you can see okay you know this is city is actually accepting applications this is generally where the city says you can open up a business and by the way here are all the competitors within a 25 mile radius so you can you know not only understand those factors that will make you choose one jurisdiction over another, but also whether what the market saturation is like. And what's interesting is that because we monitor all the regulations in the council meetings, we actually pull out information about uh, uh, dispensaries that are in development, meaning nobody has that data except for us that I'm aware of. And uh, it's not in the state database. And so you may think that a city is really great. There's no competition, but under the covers, there could be 10 dispensaries in development. Interesting. Um, as kind of like a same question, but more of a current state, are, are there any markets that you're starting to see maybe people are starting to take more looks at that we're not focused on? Um, or any any activity that that maybe you don't see in the news, like say like South Dakota, uh, or a bunch of MSOs about to move in there, or, or or are you able to kind of say that? And and that's actually a very very interesting question, um, because you know what we do is reconcile our licenses. We we align all the underlying licenses to the MSOs, and then we you know we we. Um, reconcile with the 10Ks so we can tell, you know, when an MSO is actually purchasing 
uh, more assets, and then we align to those assets. And so then we can start to see what their strategic acquisition is. And so, you know, when we look at, and because we have all of those aligned, we can see what percentage of a state's market is really held by MSOs. And we're seeing a lot of acquisition activity over in Nevada. Um, so, you know, there was sort of air strategies and uh, mm -hmm. GTI. And so there was, it's almost like a westbound sort of acquisition. Um, and you can see that within our data, right? So you can, you know, look and see from month to month where those MSOs are going and, and strategically purchasing assets. One second, there you go. I was just dropping the uh, tickers you just mentioned in the chat. Um, and you walked me into kind of my ne next question. I know that you associated many of these MSOs with their underlying licenses in an effort to allow investors to compare the quality of these assets. Um, and again, without making any recommendations, you know, not singling out, <laughs> where, can you name any MSOs that you've seen have great assets or that people have not fully understood or valued properly their assets or maybe MSOs that, that on the other hand, are overvalued in, in terms of the assets they really have. Is it, is it something you can say or can we go a different route around it? Well, let, let's just say I'm the attorney who actually structures everything so that, you know, the people who are going to make those investment decisions can can make that determination. Um, but what I can say is that we've enriched our data with information to help investors do that. Right. So we've included demographics. Uh, we have underlying documentation. I mean, it's I have to say it is it's absolutely fascinating when you when you look at from an overall market perspective, and I don't see where else you see this data, right? Where mm -hmm. you can see, you know, that the East Coast is really submerged with MSOs, which I think is gonna to totally change, you know, as soon as New York and New Jersey come around, right? So that's when we go back to the market structure. So whereas the MSOs might have a complete, you know, chokehold on the East Coast, that's going to completely sort of dissipate, you know, in New York, at least, and, and perhaps in New Jersey, as the licenses are dispersed and, and sent out to, um, and, you know, with the ownership caps. Um, so, you know, I think the, the next year is going to be very interesting. And those are the things that we're building into the business development tools so that we grow along with the markets. Um, so not only that you can, you know, find a place where to start a business, but as an investor and as a, you know, a strategic business, you can actually decide, you know, see where the market's going and where you want to go ahead of it. That's awesome. Uh, sorry, Javi, do you have a follow up before I? I mean, very brief. And again, I don't know if this is something that you can or cannot say or, or what's the deal there. But, you know, again, like in terms of, of, you know, looking at these MSOs assets and comparing them with how they're valued, they seem on average fairly valued. Or what, like, could you give us a little bit of a market overview in that sense and, and you know, in, in assets and, and how the markets are seeing them? Well, what we do, too, is extract the, the value for those transactions so that, and I, and I think it's really tough. I mean, especially, you know, with the recent SPACs is a very good example. Um, and, and this is where I really feel like people should look at the data before they're in investing in SPACs and otherwise, and especially when you're looking at the assets that are held um, by the MSOs versus the SPACs. Yeah. Um, and we, we've, we've done that where we've aligned it to the SPACs as well. And you can start to see that the different level of assets are quite different, right? And you're just like, wow, a billion dollars? <laughs> where do I get that? Um, <laughs> but it's... <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's, you know, it absolutely, we would, you know, I think that people should start looking at this underlying data, um, rather than just the information that's disclosed in the 10 Ks, because, again, the, the, the companies are so dispersed, and it's so fragmented, it really takes a dashboard view of, you know, to do an ex in a apple to apple comparison between MSOs and between SMACs and MSOs. And once you start looking at that data, and, you know, especially when you start looking at, um, you know, factors such as market saturation, where their licenses are located, uh, the uh, amount of competitive 
uh, competition or market saturation uh, versus populations, um, age groups, and other demographics, it really brings a whole new level of picture um, uh, to the, that question. And I think that question is still open because nobody's really done that analysis yet. So please yeah. come to us and we can help you. <laughs> <laughs> the analysis is being done. Um, so yeah. I have, I, I want to shift, uh, you know, thoughts here while we have a few minutes. Um, and I want to talk about your business as a whole. So obviously you work with MSOs, you work with operators, you work with people looking for uh, expansion, uh, you work with investors, um, you know, to help them understand the data and the value of what they're investing in. Um, so your business, like what's the goal exactly where you see yourself going, uh, through 2021, uh, and mm -hmm. perhaps, you know, are, is there any way that, you know, we might be able to invest in you one day? No, I would, I would love that. <laughs> and we would love that. Um, you know, I think that, I think we haven't, we, what we, we really wanted to grow organically because you have much more control over the company. Um, and what we want to do is really help businesses from a I want to say seed to sale, but it really is from concept, you know, initially when you're deciding to start a cannabis business and, and, you know, it's really tough if you're a compliance company, right? And so people have been using legal and compliance technologies to fill the role of really understanding what the market structure looks like and where they can actually locate a business. And so we want to help people initially when they, when they go to start the business, help them find a jurisdiction that meets what they want to do and then grow along with them. So as I said before, we have an enterprise compliance technology. So the data can be used to help them build their brick and mortar operations. And then as soon as the brick and mortar operations are built, now we have risk and compliance technology to help them maintain the value of the asset overall. And as life goes on and as the company matures, they're going to continue growing strategy, whether it's MA or whether it's still organic. Um, so we want to be there in that you know circle of life with that cannabis company uh, for as long as possible. Um, and then, you know, hopefully uh, branch out to other industries as well. I love that. Are you able to give us a clue and uh, not, you don't have to say names in terms of who you're working with, but uh, the depth uh, of which you're working in the cannabis space right now? Any sense of that? You know, I think that there are, you know, different levels of how people have been achieving growth. And you guys, you know, know that there has been a very large um, M&A um, component of this versus, you know, sort of mm -hmm. the organic growth or moving into expansion strategies. Yeah, I think, I think the cost just given just how many states are actually moving into the space, the cost of doing anything manually, whether you're a real estate uh, broker, whether you're a lawyer, whether you are an MSO or somebody who's just looking to get in, it, it, it's getting overwhelming and, and it, it's, you're going to miss out and things are going to run, you know, go through the cracks. And so if you really want to build the best asset with and have the most choices to make a really rational decision in understanding the data, um, then you're going to need some type of platform like, like ours to help you understand where you can have a business, how to build the business, and then how to comply with the regulations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. I have a, we have time for one more question, just one minute. Uh, and I want to make sure that we pass okay. along one of the questions from the audience, from Jesse Raymond. It's very specific. He, he or she or they are asking if you see New York State allowing individuals to start cannabis production businesses as a sole proprietorship. Wow. <laughs> I don't like, like you guys don't like you guys don't give recommendations. I don't give legal advice. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I, I think that we're going to have to wait until New York releases its rules uh, to really understand. And hopefully and, and, you know, if you guys think about it, I mean, New Jersey and again, we go back to we've been working with New Jersey since 2019 and they have not, you know, those licenses haven't been released. We just, uh, you know, we input 1,500 cities, towns, and villages for New York. So we are currently monitoring 1,500, right? So, and it's really uh, kind of interesting because the data that we're pulling out and that we're sending to our clients is that New York seems much more amenable to, you know, consumption lounges, dispensaries versus, you know, the meeting and information that we're seeing from New Jersey. But going back to, you know, your the question, 
reach out to us. We can help you, you know, find a grow license and, and would be happy to, you know, talk to you about that. Great segue. Where can they reach out to you? Uh, you can reach us at uh, contact at thcregs.com. Contact at thcregs.com. Can we get that up there, uh, Aaron? Uh, awesome. Susan, always a pleasure to have you. Um, I mean, data is just becoming oh, so massively important in this industry, and you guys are at the forefront. I couldn't even name any competitors, to be quite honest. So uh, I think what you're doing is pretty awesome. Not content, contact. Aaron. <laughs> Did I say that wrong? Contact. I don't know. Yeah. Contact. Contact. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. yeah. Now we got it. Fantastic. Susan, thank you so much for being with us. Right. We really appreciate it. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for having me. All right. I'll see you soon. Bye bye. All right. Javi, I mean, just the data aspect alone is so interesting to me. And the reason I asked that last question is because I think every MSO should be working with her. Oh, yeah. like I do. I, I think everybody should have the data that she's providing. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And I, I know I asked her to to spill some of this and, and uh, you know. We kept she, pushing and she, she, she did good. I she tried. did good. I tried. I, tried. <laughs> I mean, part of being an executive is knowing how to dodge a question. And she did well. Like, like she did good at that. Like you, I you, just, if, if you can't answer, you have to think of something similar that you can answer, right? It's like, okay. Oh. Oh yeah. I can't explain this, but here's an interesting insight on the topic. Well, it's like I know a few of the people she works with. I didn't want to say if she didn't want to say, but um, she's she's working with some pretty big people, y'all. And uh, so keep an eye on her. I would say check out her website if you're an investor, like a serious investor in cannabis. Uh, I think you should be looking at her platform uh, again. That's THC Regs. Contact at thcregs.com. Javier, uh, let me pose those questions again and then we can get any thoughts before we bring Brian on. Um, Three minutes for news. I'm timing you. Don't all right, what can of stocks are you focused on? Uh, are, and I mean that via sector. Uh, are you focused on recreational, medicinal, and or biotech or just a general cannabis sense? Uh, and then are you strengthening your positions in, in the dip we're seeing in a ton of these stocks. Anyway, go. You got two minutes for news before Brian comes on and drops a knowledge bomb on us. I'm just going to go with headlines. Univo Pharma, Israel-based company, will bring the legendary cannabis breeder DNA Genetics to Israel. That's all. Wow. Good one. I love okay. It. I didn't realize. I didn't even know that. Rezwan working cool. over there. Out of Cookies Enterprises, Burner's cannabis company and lifestyle company, Two news items. Today, they debut a line of CBD flower and, and, and you know, a CBD flower market. Uh, and then the other thing that's very, very interesting is yesterday, Burner Cookies, uh, Chris Weber, former NBA player, recently inducted into the NBA Hall of Fame, and Jason Wild uh, joined forces to create Cookies University or Cookies U. This is a program, it's a, it's a scholarship program that will select some people, uh, you know, people from communities who have been marginalized or heavily impacted by the war on drugs and provide them with a three and a half month hands-on training program for them to start a cannabis business. And this is awesome, right? I love it. Yeah, I mean, much, much needed. Uh, this industry needs more of this. Uh, and I think the industry as a whole will be better for it, getting more people involved. Honestly, it could not be a more perfect segue to our next guest. And I have some cannabis news that we'll, we'll do at the end as well. So we may go a few minutes over uh, if you guys are okay with that. But uh, getting access, access, um, that is what I'm going to say as we bring on Brian. Uh, sorry, Javi, I cut you off, but that was just too perfect of a segue in my opinion. And Brian, great. how yes. are you? You know, I'm doing really well, and I'm glad I got to watch the previous segment so I could be schooled, as you say, on dodging questions that you guys appreciate that. If you ask me questions I need to dodge, you'll appreciate the talent as opposed to... Uh, it's a skill. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a resume builder, man. Hey, you know what's really funny? I, I know this has nothing to do with the cannabis, but you know, you guys know me. I'm, I'm a straight up guy. Uh, one of the skills I learned in college, I played college football, was no matter what the question was, hey, the coaches had a good game plan. We worked hard in practice, and we came out and executed, and things worked well. We're going to enjoy this tonight, and then let's get uh, on to the next week. So I no matter like what, I just watched know, every press conference ever. I know, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> 
That was good. Uh, right. Javier, I bet you get that one a lot from your CEOs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's fair. It, it's a question we have to ask, right? Remember on Tuesday, we had some public companies and, and some of the earnings were not as strong. And first question was like, dude, okay, you know, what's what up, up with it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, what up, you know? And, and you got to be prepared to answer, even if it's, you know, we tried and gave 100% of, of what we had, we just like have to try harder. Yeah. I mean, so, that's... So kind of, kind of leading into this, uh, Brian, you are doing some awesome things. Uh, you presented at our last conference uh, last week. Uh, the chat loved you. So y'all pay attention to what uh, Brian's about to say, because I think you guys are going to love him too. But we're diving in a little bit more specifically to what you're doing uh, in perhaps the this restricted market of CBD and cannabis. Um, but first things first, tell us what you are doing at Surge Pace uh, and who you are. Yeah, sure. I think the, the the guys will appreciate the you know 30, 60 second background on, on what we've built. And then I'll steer things more toward what people are on here Please. to listen to you guys talk about, which is it relates to cannabis and distribution and uh, in this market we all appreciate. Um, my background been 20 years of dealing with and selling underbanked products, fintech products, uh, folks that, um, that don't have credit, uh, the underbanked immigrants, uh, that third of the population that depends on convenience stores, bodegas, tiendas, gas stations, and what have you for most of their uh, their needs. It's a quasi bank and quasi epicenter and central nervous system for these communities. Uh, I go way back to prepaid home phone, evolved into wireless. And then we realized, hey, there's a market out here for a software platform to connect all of these stores with not only us as a wireless company, but all the other wireless companies where folks can more easily pay their bill, the days of getting money orders and all these other chaotic, crazy uh, snail mail type things are over. Let's get some things out there that can help folks uh, right where they are. They don't have to get a ride to the mall where they got their cell phone to go pay the bill. Uh, so, it, you know, in being a conqueror minded guy and, and a sales guy at my core, it was always a relationship goal for me. OK, I love this market of all the, the ethnicities that, uh, that that own these independently owned stores coast to coast across the country. And as they as we became profit partners with these guys and, and the more underbank products we started selling, naturally it evolved into, hey, you know, we're having some distribution problems, you know, whether our sales guys not around or there's some issues or, hey, I've got these big high minimums we're not able to achieve. And I've got a I just don't get the pricing. Can you help me with this? So about four years ago, when we merged our fintech and telecommunications company into the public vehicle, uh, which is now Surge Pace, we merged it in. I was like, you know what? We're going to do a wholesale products platform as another module that runs side by side with our underbank fintech products. We're going to base the platform on blockchain and we're going to tie all this together and we're going to revolutionize and flip this upside down where it's no longer going to have that two to two yeah, weeks. Can you go back for a second? I got lost. <laughs> that was sure. too much. <laughs> sure. <laughs> this is awesome. Like this is, this is needed though, Brian. Like it, it really is. After you're done, I'm going to share a story because this just hits a personal nerve. <laughs> Like Sorry, so where do you want him to go back to, Javi? Yeah, which so part do you want to go back? I, 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 I move fast. Merge, how do you merge telecom and payments, and, and where does blockchain come in? I was like, dude, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, I was trying to, you know what? Hey, I always try to give the mile high view, and wherever you guys want me to stop and dive in and, and get granular, I, I love it. Uh, as a matter of fact, I love this interface better than standing up and giving a presentation any day. Um, we own, or I own two companies, a fintech transaction company and a wireless community, an MBNO. And, you know, look, I turned 40. I was like, hey, you know, been blessed. It's, it's been a pretty good life so far. I want to make a run. Uh, I want to put together a good team of, of entrepreneurs that would never come to work for me, but would work for a public company and make a run with me. And I want to bring on a team of guys across the board that believe in me and believe in what we're doing. So that was the four years ago moment where we said, hey, let's put this in a vehicle. Let's go to the OTC. Hey, let's let's get our bruises in the public market. Let's learn the public market. Let's learn IR. Let's learn all of these other acronyms and things that we haven't learned in 20 years of private business. Let's learn it. Then let's prepare to go to NASDAQ and, and be ready and make sure when we get the major leagues, we know how to hit a curveball. So that was the that was how we brought everything together. Now, four years ago, obviously, you know, as, as we're starting to 
interview and entertain companies and manufacturers and, and talk to convenience store owners and gas stations and what products are you most, in, most interested in? That's where the, uh, I don't want to call it a love affair, but the interest peaked for me back then it was hemp and CBD with the farm bill and all those things as we were hitting and, you know, different States were more aggressive. And the cool thing about our platform was we're able to isolate all the way down to a zip code as it pertains to legalities, as it pertains to certain products, as it pertains to, um, I mean, the, your, your previous guest was mentioning, you know, yeah. rules and regulations in New York. Um, and as products evolve, or let me rephrase it, not the products evolve, products are always going to evolve, but as regulations catch up with the evolving products, then we're able to unleash those products instantly into these markets where people shop. They don't have to specifically go to now as it you know relates to uh, the, uh, the, the CBD products, the Delta 8 products. And as we keep evolving in that direction, they don't have to seek out and find that specific store that we all see in the strip malls that used to be kind of the vape slash CBD plus 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 store. Now they can go right to the gas station or the C store, the corner market where they already go. Uh, a lot of these folks go three to five times a week. Now they can go in and we're setting these stores up uh, with, uh, I mean, I, I actually pulled some of them out, everything, got some cool companies here that we already work with. Uh, everything from the CBD, Delta 8, disposable vapes, you name it, if it can be sold, we're going to sell it and we're enabling these corner stores to service their customers in a way that they would, you know, otherwise have to go to those specialty stores. And we've seen over the past year, especially with the oddities. Now, look, we don't expect another pandemic every other year. And hopefully this is the only one we experience in our lifetime. But hey, our stores were essential. While it did hamper my salespeople's ability to go out and shake hands and communicate and bring on new stores, our revenue didn't fall because all of these stores are essential. They stayed open. Uh, we were all dependent on convenience stores and these community stores. And so we look at this as a great play. Obviously, we sell lots of other products too, everything from bag snacks to uh, you know, personal care items, herbal enhancers, energy shots, a lot of the other consumable products you would uh, find at a convenience store, you know, as far as our company goes, but where it applies to, you know, this segment is I think we're primed coast to coast for uh, every time there's an evolving product, we're ready. You know, we can't get out, out maneuvered because we're not a one trick pony where, you know, oh man, if something changes from Delta eight, you know, guys, we got to rejigger the whole factory and, and rethink this whole thing. And, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it just doesn't matter. No different than when the, I, the new iPhone came out and it had a different charger. Hey, fantastic. Let's start selling the new adapters for the chargers, uh, you know, and, and bring those products in. So in summary, We've taken a fintech transaction platform that we use and go out to convenience stores and we engage them in a way that helps them make more money by servicing their customers. Everything from loading debit cards, wireless payments, uh, anything, bill payments, check cashing, anything that could help those customers uh, and help that store owner get more door swings and make more money transactionally from those customers. We upsell the store owner products that they're either a getting now that we can get them at a cheaper rate, getting direct from the manufacturer, or we get them a bigger variety, which that's been the big key for us, a bigger variety of products, especially in this market. Uh, I can't tell you how much we have test markets in Las Vegas, Memphis, and Chicago. I personally went to those markets and I walked into convenience store owners. And as soon as they saw that we could get them uh, some of these products or Delta eight products or a different variety than that one CBD or that one Delta eight product that their distributor provides them. I mean, they latched on immediately. Uh, and we've also, and this is one of the things that maybe I, I need to talk to, you know, you guys about helping us out. Mm -hmm. I've got about 30 to 40 products in this category right now. I'd like to get two more manufacturers to give us a little bit more of a, a well-rounded variety. So hopefully there's some guys out there watching that may have some uh, strategic plays in some companies that are looking to get their products out coast to coast. Right now we actively distribute to 8,000 stores. I've got 35,000 stores on my platform. We're actively outbound calling. And now that the world is opening up and we're no longer having to do business like this, where our salespeople are, you know, where as a matter of fact, we hired two full-time in-house salespeople this week. So we're, we're, we're hustling. Our company is led by me, a sales guy at heart. Um, I couldn't always, tell. Yeah. Always, <laughs> hey, no, no, 
<laughs> well, hey, here's the thing. Look, you know, it's funny. I talk to a lot of guys, obviously. And just so you know, from a, from a, a 20 second corporate perspective, you know, we're hopefully on the one yard line sticking with the football metaphors uh, with the SEC and NASDAQ. We got Maxim Group already signed on to do our registered offering. We're ready to go. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Yeah. So so meanwhile, I I love this part of my day, by the way. The first half of my day till two or three o'clock, I'm wearing a regulatory auditor, attorney, underwriter. You know, it's all <laughs> these filings and it's, uh, you know, I got to do this. Hey, I, I love talking about the company and, and, and uh, you know, being a sales guy at heart and not really an IT guy or not really a, a doctor that's trying to save the world through a cure. I mean, look, I, I sell products. I, I, I'm happy, but never content. Um, and we're making a run and we're, we're having a blast. Yeah. Let me just jump on that real quick. And hey, guys, if you all have any, <laughs> help us out. If you have any products, if you walked yeah. into a convenience store, uh, and you wanted to see, I thought I saw Charlotte's web in your hand, by the way, they're gummies. I'm not sure if I was <laughs> right about that. Um, drop it in the chat. What CBD yeah. products would you want to see in a convenience store? Um, and, and also Ryan, by the way, can you drop us real quick an, an email or something where they can reach you? You said there's two companies and this episode, more than 2000 companies will see this specific episode, right? No, absolutely. And Hey, we have a, uh, we have a full-time, a product aggregator that would love to, I mean, that's their job is to basically talk to the companies, work out how, you know, and, and, and by the way, we deal with companies that are, I've got a bag snack pork rind company that's so rudimentary that we send them PDFs with pick, pack and ship. And then we have, you know, fully integrated API, EDI type companies that use scanners and barcodes to ship out products. So, you know, we, we built the technology. We own it soup to nuts. So we're able to integrate with any company. If they would use, I don't have an email address just for this. I mean, I'm flying by the seat of my pants here. But if they would send it to invest at surgepays.com, invest at surgepays.com, I'll give the folks a heads up that get those emails to please expect some potential manufacturers of some cool uh, cannabis related products that I requested they sent that. And those will get funneled over to me personally. I still, you know, we're not too big where I, I don't check out uh, every product and give the, the thumbs up and sign off. I'm, I'm, I'm a maniac about our brand and about what we put out there. I want to make sure that the company is able to sustain ordering. I mean, you know, we start doing 10, 20, 30,000, uh, excuse me, orders a month. Uh, I mean, think about it. It's all numbers. Uh, and as we grow, uh, you know, 8,000, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 stores. Uh, I mean, look, I've got an operations center down in Central America that's staffed with 100 folks, customer service, bilingual. So it doesn't even matter if it's if it's an English store. So we're, we're ready to scale quickly. I need manufacturers that can scale with us. Um, you know, I don't want to earn shelf space. The worst thing in the world you can do is go out there and get shelf space. And then next thing you know, this the customer Nobody comes back to it. buy this product and it's not there. Mm -hmm. Now, I just cost that store owner money and we're catching heat. And the, uh, the 30 other products I'm selling them, now we're having to backpedal. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, we're trying to do our... So I want I want manufacturers that can keep up with us and, and make us look good. And then what that does, that enables me to go back and say, oh, by the way, Hey, let me supply you with a couple of these other products in this category. I'll take care of you. We got you. Uh, you yeah. know, I'm your partner. That's awesome. I, I kind of just want to point out what I'm hearing a little bit. You so when I first came to Benzinga, crypto and blockchain, I was not allowed to mix those with cannabis. <laughs> Uh, I was told not to, uh, very specifically. Yeah, right. um, yeah so uh, it, it's because both were so volatile, right? But how? You know, but you all are, are taking this hot technology uh, and you're mixing it with frontline human contact. Um, so, I mean, how are you using blockchain to affect like an emerging industry like cannabis? Uh, and do you think this is just the first of many companies to do this or do you think you're, you're doing something nobody else can? I'm I'm fairly confident right now. I'm not. Well, look, I'm not going to say I'm doing something that nobody else can, uh, but I think we're doing something right now that nobody else has done. Uh, I mean, this has taken millions of dollars of development and obviously years of thinking and trial and error to put this together. I mean, you know, I made that when I first talked to Elliot on your team, the first time we talked, I was like, hey, my first press release in 2017, I mentioned blockchain and digital currency. And within a week, I was on a conference call with FINRA. So they, they're like, what is blockchain? And I'm like, well, time out. This is not, this is not Bitcoin. You know, we're time out. Time out. No, I'm not, you know, don't send the brown, the brown shirts yet. Uh, so I've been very careful, but uh, not, you know, we play chess. 
you know, we don't play checkers. So while we do all of these things to build out relationships with these stores, keep in mind every one of these stores to do transactions with us, we're daily settling up with them via ACH and their checking accounts. So they're on our platform securely. We're adding stores every single day to a closed loop network, coast to coast. Every transaction that they do is on the blockchain, whether it's orders for uh, CBD products, whether it's a payment for a wireless plan by carrier, by whatever. We're, we're, we're amassing such a significant amount of data on the underbanked, which is the last digital frontier in this country. Uh, you know, and I do believe that's ultimately a, a compounding value of what we're building. And then keep in mind, our ability to settle up every day, whether you ordered uh, a case of, uh, uh, of CBD or what have you, whether there was a payment made, well, everything is run behind the scenes. I mean, we're integrated with Azure. We're uh, integrated with AWS. Um, APIing into an exchange where folks can use value if they do have a cryptocurrency, ultimately one day when regulators are OK with that and they're able to tax it and control it, which let's be honest, that's what it is. That's why cannabis is becoming legal now. They can tax and control it. That's the, we just we have to go ahead and admit what we live under. But once they're able to be comfortable with the fact that that we can settle up, that they're getting their taxes, that they know what's going on. You know, ultimately, we've built out that 10, 20, 50, 100,000 stores. Yes, they're buying products from us. Yes, we're doing a significant amount of revenue at super high multiples because numbers, you know, multiply quickly. But we've also got this railroad track of distribution that we can plug in directly with exchanges. And by the way, I, I do, you know, I, I don't mix it with surge pays. But obviously, on, in my spare time, I don't gamble, but I do enjoy, uh, you know, I do enjoy trading. Uh, you know, <laughs> well, look, I, I got to get my brain off. of, You know, I do sleep at some point. So that 30 minutes before I go to sleep, I, I try to detox my brain. Um, but no, I, I think one of our big value plays three, four down, four years down the road will be, hey, we have 50 to 100,000 stores that are all interconnected on a blockchain network that can be integrated with any digital currency exchange out there or other facilitating factor of tokenization, whatever you want to call it, where it can settle up. And these are all independently owned stores. This is not where you go. Obviously, you've seen me a couple of times, guys. I joke around. I'm not a coat and tie guy. I'm not. My market's not that. I'd get booted out of the store if I walked in there. These are all stores that you have to go and shake their hand eye to eye, Trust you, they work five, six days a week, 12 hours a day. Um, many of them are immigrants and we're able to have this relationship with them that's priceless. So, yeah, doesn't matter whether it's the um, uh, a digital currency that comes out uh, that, that is now approved and able to be used for transactions in a value where somebody comes in with a card or an app or some kind of uh, code that you scan on their um, their phone. We'll be primed and ready. We've already got the railroad track there. Just load up and go. Uh, and by the way, on the cannabis related products, it's the exact same thing. Our value is the relationships that we've built and are building and compounding every day. And think about this, too. You know, with everything out there, there's all, you know, I've, gosh, I've had millions and millions of, of uh, wireless customers on my MVNO. And part of your business model is always your, you know, your loss, your customers that drop off each month. Well, we convenience stores have been around. And if you look at distributors for convenience stores, Ultimately, our competitors, they're all mom and pops that have been around for generations. Uh, it's really interesting. A lot of the convenience store distributors have been, the companies are over 100 years old. Well, that tells you two things. Number one, they're doing it the way that they did it yesterday, usually. And they're primed for us to go in and, hey, offer the store a better way, a different way, a faster way, a more efficient way. Number two, it tells you the convenience stores have been around a while. And they're mm -hmm. probably going to continue to be around as our culture shifts more and yeah. more and more to, hey, I'm going to order the things that I need in bulk. But the things I need, ah, you know, batteries. Hey, I need to go out there and get uh, a pill that's going to make sure I'm not hung over tomorrow. Or I need to get <laughs> some Pedialyte. <laughs> Come on. I feel you, man. I, yeah. I, I love what you're doing. I, I really do. The data you can amass, the network you're creating. Uh, the technology you're utilizing while still being person to person and having a bilingual center. There's a lot of value here. I need to throw it to Javi because I've asked like four questions here. So Javi, well, I mean, we're give me time thoughts. for questions almost, but you know, here's one thought, right? 
And you say it's, it's also an important service. And, and you know, I want to share a personal, my personal experience, right? I am an American citizen who grew up abroad, spent my entire life abroad, right? And, and it went back to the US, got a job at Benzinga. And I tried to get a credit card. Guess what? I didn't have credit. I was underbanked or unbanked. And I went to the, the, to the bank and the bank wouldn't want to open an account for me. And when I finally got an account, I was like, okay, how do I get a credit card? And the response was, well, you need a credit score. And I go, okay, how do I build a credit score? They want like with a credit card. Well, so, okay, like, so this is a catch 22 infinite loop kind of situation where we are, you know, essentially locked out of the traditional ways to do business. And we're not talking cannabis here, right? We're talking traditional business banking of, of any sort, right? So what search, search page does, right, in, in a sense, to me is, is just amazing, right? You, you really fill a gap for all these underbanked and unbanked people. And, and you've, if you've never been unbanked, you, it's likely that you don't understand what it is, you know, how it feels, you know, that you're not able to do what everyone else does, what your income suggests you should be able to do, what, you know, what your lifestyle suggests you're, you should be able to be doing, right? Buying, acquiring, getting credit for. Um, so that was, you know, the, the quick thoughts. And I have a brief question from the audience. Uh, Jason wanted to know what kind of companies use the wireless offerings, you know, the wireless products that you, you sell. Yeah. You know what? Hey, that's a, first of all, Javi, uh, I, I understand I've never been underbanked, but I've opened this, the last 20 years has opened my eyes so much. Yeah. You, you've been asking around. You know? uh, and you know, I, I spent probably half my life for about six or seven years down in El Salvador, building our BPO, our operations center. Uh, some of my best friends in the world don't look like me. I mean, is this, so it's opened my eyes. You know, you realize the world's a bigger place. We're all, you know, I don't want that's another conversation for, for another segment, <laughs> but, but no, you understand. I've talked to so many people now that are my friends that, that, that were not able to get credit cards. And then it, it, it puts you in a terrible spiral where you pay more for everything. Yep. My my first company in prepaid home phone, I looked around. I'm like, man, these people that can't get home phone, they can't get a job because their employer can't call them. But they've got to come up with a two hundred and fifty dollar deposit to get a daggum phone. And then they've got to pay eighty dollars a month when the doctors and lawyers down here are just paying thirty nine. So I actually I was the one that flipped home phone upside down and said, hey, we're not going to do deposits anymore. You're going to pay up front, i.e. prepaid. So, you know, just to kind of date me a little bit, but show you where I've been in this market in the underbank. I was like, why should they have to pay more? Just make it pay up front. That's fine. That's fair. And then pay the same rate. That's actually how I made my first million was just charging underbank folks the exact same rates as everybody else and just making them pay wow. up front. Like I said, the, the revolutionary, man. Yeah, the, the, the advent revolutionary. Of <laughs> and, you know, and that, but I mean, then, then that parlayed into, you know, got out in 2010. Funny story. As soon as I saw a flip phone that could send a picture, I was like, hey, man. Copper dial tone. <clears throat> hey, you know what? I'm going to go another football. You know when to punt sometimes, right? Play field. <laughs> Let's get into wireless. Um, but um, the, um, the the this the question about wireless. That's a fantastic opportunity for me to explain really quickly how that works. We're integrated with every prepaid wireless company out there from Boost, TrackPhone. We own our own MBNO, uh, you know, kind of like the vanilla brand for those that just want to, you know, just, just want to be a, a active there. Metro PCS, every one of them, there, there'll be a little sticker or a poster on the gas station, bodega, tienda, whatever it is, where it'll tell them, hey, pay your plan here, top up here, get more, you know, pay your prepaid here. And so they'll walk in and let's say that I've got track phone and I owe 40 bucks and it's Friday afternoon and my life enjoyment is significantly going to be affected if that number ain't working. If I, don't, if I can't call my buddies over the weekend. So I walk in, I go down to the gas station, I pay, uh, I put $40 on the counter. The store owner asks me my, my telephone number. I tell them, they type that in, they type in $40 and hit boom. That night we ACH the store owner. For that $40 minus his commission on that transaction, the credit post instantly to the, you know, to my, to my account for $40. And what we've done, I don't know whether you remember this or not, but we used to go to the gas stations and corner stores and you would see that four foot section of peg hooks. You'd see like, for example, track phone, five, 15, 25, 40. Mm -hmm. I think your best buy too. We digitized all that. It's instant. So everything is completely digital, completely instant. It's real-time replenishment, RTR is what we call it. 
So it, it's easier for the customer. You don't have to scratch off the back and enter a, a 23 digit, uh, which by the way, I've always joked around that that was the advent of cryptocurrency was prepaid cards because you had a sequence of numbers that represented and held a value. I used, uh, them. I used them to like five years ago or six years ago. You just called this like long ass number and then enter like 70,000. <laughs> yeah, <digits>. yeah. <laughs> your, the, the number you've, you've entered is not correct. Please yeah. try it. <laughs> Which like, by oh. the way, is a challenge if you've already let your time expired. So, yeah, so that, you know, and look, a lot of people, and it's another convenience. You know, most folks will get their prepaid phone at a kind of like wireless plus 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 store near the mall or, you know, something that's not real close to their home. And but as humans, we usually go back to where we got something because we assume that's where we have to pay for it because they don't have a credit card and don't have a checking account. Now they can just go to the convenience store where they're already going three to four times a week. We create the awareness of the store level and then boom. And the cool thing is that store owner, see, we flipped the old business idea of you've got to spend money to make money upside down for the store owner too. Think about this. Every single thing in that store, that store owners laid out money for inventory. He has to put money into inventory and take a risk to make money. With ours, using our example, let's say that his commission is 10%. He takes a $40 payment. We ACH 36 tomorrow. He made four bucks for merely accommodating a customer and assisting them in a, in a more efficient, life enhancing uh, transaction than what they would otherwise have had. And so now you don't think it's easier for me to come back and send my sales guy in and go, all right, Javi. Hey, man, look, you're making about four hundred dollars a month on our transactions. Hey, man, give me a shot. Once you once you buy, I, I got a cool new Delta eight product. Give it a whirl there. It's selling great down the road. I mean, look, it's it's a natural flow to an upsell. You help me out. I want to give you more business. I want. Hey, and I like you. You're not asking me for money. You're, you're here to help me. You're my partner, man. And so you do get that warm door pull as opposed to the, oh God, here's, here's yeah. Brian again. Here's, <laughs> here's a, here he is. I don't have time today. I don't have time today. Um, yeah. Brian, I'm sorry, man. We are about seven minutes over. I just, no, I, can no, I've enjoyed I can talk to you all day. That was my no, I've enjoyed it. I love it guys. I, I love this it. is awesome. You are going to be back on our YouTube. I think on power hour next month, date to yeah. come. Uh, but this conversation is not over for Benzinga and Surge Pace. Uh, you, you made a believer out of me. I think Javi the same. Uh, guys, if you loved hearing from Brian, drop a one in the chat. Uh, but Brian, it's always a pleasure talking to you, my friend. Thank you hey, so much for being to here. Look w w w hey, you yeah. guys are awesome. I really enjoyed it. Favorite part of my day. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate you, my friend. We'll see you soon. All right. Y'all right. have a good one now. Awesome. So everybody, that was O-T-C-S-U-R-G, uh, yeah. SurgePays.com. Brian Cox is doing, he's doing a lot, a lot of good. Uh, I, I love it. I am, you know, as a personal investor, I'll, I'll probably for sure take a look there. Um, so Javier, any yeah. last comments, my friend? I know we got to wrap up or air. We're my completely out of time. One quick <laughs> shout out this Saturday, Benzinga is hosting its options boot camp. You know, if you're not trading options, you're missing out in a, in a big piece of the market. Uh, and these boot camps are great. I've, I've read hundreds. We're going to have some crypto videos. content too. It is options. There will be options content. But y'all, you think we're going to you think we're going to skip out on the crypto? You're wrong. Um, there is going to be some crypto content there. So, Let's yeah, Javier, it. it's always a blast doing this with you, my friend. You um, too. We're going to do this again next week. Check out Ascend Wellness. Awesome earnings. They almost tripled their frigging Q1 revenue from last year. Terrison did a great job. Mm -hmm. That's the news. We went through it as quick as we can. Uh, two awesome interviews. Love you guys. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron, show us what's happening Saturday. Yep.